this design programming lecture, I want to finally get to a question that we've kind of been dancing around for a few lectures now. And that is this idea of computational creativity. Best expressed in this single question, can a computer do design? This is the part where I'm really sad that we're doing this over YouTube, so I can't stop and take some uh, answers from the room over this one. This is exactly where the interactivity of a face-to-face -face lecture truly shines, because I'm fascinated to think what you think about this. So what do we actually mean by design, right? Because that word, I think you'll all agree, after a little while doing a design degree, is a little bit overloaded, right? Well, let's talk about a couple of specific things that we don't mean. People often talk about design to mean both this routine, doing very simple plans to put together a simple object or system that solves a problem. And at the same time, they use the same word to talk about this very innovative, original, creative, coming up with a completely left field solution to a problem. They're both called design. They seem to superficially follow the same processes, but let's see if we can tease out what a routine designing, because obviously a computer, when given a proper specification of a problem, can produce a reasonable solution to it. Let's call that routine design and say that if there isn't some unknown part of the problem, some messy part of the problem, and that isn't designed for the purposes of this. So we're focusing on creative design or design with the capacity to be creative. That is problems that are sufficiently ill-framed enough, complex enough, tricky enough, that they could involve creativity in their solutions. So on one end, we have routine, well-specified problems where there is an easily understood process and an easily understood space of possible solutions, and we can apply an algorithm to solve those. You search through, you try out all of the different things, and yeah, you end up with a solution. And on the other end, we have creative problems, problems which aren't easily bounded or uneasily described or where it isn't easy to know whether you've found a solution. And that's what we're talking about. Can a computer do that kind of design? I also want to separate the different phases of the design process, right? So obviously, once you've had an idea and you've specified exactly what strategy or approach you're going to use, you can render one of those uh, indescribable, difficult, creative problems of design down into something where it's mostly about working out the details. And once you've got that bounded space with a clear objective, yeah, okay, so an algorithm could be useful there. I'm interested in the other end. I'm interested in the conceptual phases of design. How do you come up with an idea? How do you interpret the problem such that an idea is possible? How do you do creative conceptual design? with a computer, is that possible? So maybe a better question that we could be asking is can a computer be creative? Can it generate ideas as part of a creative design process? Well, what do we mean by creative? Further and further down the definitions rabbit hole here, I think one way to define creative, and there are many if you look at the research, but let's just focus on one that's kind of accessible for, for this lecture, is a combination of original or surprising or new in some way and valuable. Not just monetary value, even though I've used that symbol here, but social value, personal value, contextual value, organizational value. In other words, a creative artifact is one that is meaningfully new and also useful. So then we get a new question. Can a computer produce, that is plan or create, original and useful artifacts? Because if it could, then it could do the conceptual part of designing. It turns out that this is a question that has uh, engaged computer scientists since before there was such a thing as computer science. Uh, Ada Lovelace, progenitor of modern ideas about algorithms and compilers and also computer music and computer game playing, someone who when she lived, there wasn't even such a thing as a computer. She was a mathematician who had read the notes of Charles Babbage about his analytical engine, which was an analog computer proposed by Babbage, but never built in his or Lady Lovelace's lifetimes because the 
capacity to machine that many parts at such high precision would have been prohibitively expensive. But based only on Babbage's and other people's notes, Ada Lovelace started speculating about the capabilities of this kind of machine. And in doing so, she came to some thoughts about artificial intelligence and creativity. She wrote in 1843, the analytical engine, meaning in her, in her days, computer, has no pretensions to originate anything. And she goes on to say it can only create that which we tell it how to create. So this idea, this is often referred to in computational creativity circles as Lady Lovelace's objection, a term which was given to it by Alan Turing, writing 107, 107 years later uh, on uh, artificial intelligence again. Turing, of course, formalized the idea of a computer from a mathematical perspective and wrote about it in the aftermath of World War II after his uh, inventions, his, his work in cryptography and in general purpose problem solving with machines, what we would now refer to as computing, helped win World War II for the British. Turing wrote in direct response to Lovelace's comments from over a hundred years earlier, actually machines take me by surprise with great frequency. By which he means, well, Lady Lovelace says that you can only have a computer do what you tell it to do. But actually, the idea that once you've told it to do something, you understand all of the possible consequences of those instructions is silly. Computers can do very complex things. They could do so even in the 1950s. So just because you know what you told it to do doesn't mean you'll know every possible output of that process. Thus, the computer possesses a capacity to surprise and therefore a capacity to do something original. So in Turing's perspective, it doesn't matter that you did tell the machine what to do, and at some level you do have to tell the machine what to do, because you can easily tell it to do something complex enough that you will be surprised by some of the answers. So these are thoughts from almost one and two centuries ago about this question of computational creativity, because of course creativity is the heart of intelligence and intelligence is the heart of the question about whether we can make machines that might be able to replicate the thing that we've thus far only seen in ourselves. Before I continue the discussion about creativity and intelligence, I just want to take a moment to say that these two thoughts that we've heard here, these founding framing questions of this field were from a woman who was only allowed to publish that paper because it was perceived as a translation of a man's work with some appendices and notes, as in the vast majority of the paper was her own work, it just wasn't really accredited as such, and from a gay man who won the largest war in human history but still ended up being chemically castrated after it was revealed he was a deviant. None of those things are relevant to this lecture, I just think it helps to know exactly what we're dealing with here. If you ever f uh, face an argument with someone who says that there would be an economic cost to being socially progressive, then perhaps you can cite this as an example that there is a huge economic cost in just the lost genius of the deviant when you persecute people for something that is unrelated to the value that they bring to society. But now I am thoroughly on a digression. We could of course go from this discussion about machines capacity to surprise down another definitional rabbit hole and ask ourselves what is surprise and how might a machine be able to operationalize that? How do you actually measure surprise? How could a computer predict a human surprise? But that is of course a crazy and foolhardy direction that is not relevant here nor to anything else. So I will just say Here's like nine of my papers on the subject. So maybe to extricate ourselves from the philosophical for a second, we want to see what weaker versions of that question we can say that we've already answered. Let's have a look at a simple version of that. Can humans use AI to be creative? Well, yeah, definitely. We've looked at a whole bunch of examples of people using AI creatively. So AI and uh, 
AI generated other things like images and music and so forth are clearly a legitimate creative domain. But that's probably the weakest version uh, of this question about whether AI can help people be creative. So let's move on to the next one. Can AI augment the creativity of humans? In other words, can an AI and a human working together be more creative than the human would have been alone? And I think we can say, yeah, definitely in that sense too. We've seen enough examples of uh, humans working together with AI that we can say, yeah, okay, so you can use an AI tool to generate inspiration or to generate some stimuli or some component, and then you can riff off that. And human creativity can be augmented by the presence of that AI tool. So that seems pretty straightforward. Um, I'll show you some more examples of that at the end of the lecture. But then that gives us a stronger version of the question that is not quite so out of reach as the true formulation of whether a computer can be creative by itself. And that is, can an AI working with a human, an AI-human collaboration, can the AI take on some of the creative decision making? Can it take on some of the autonomy in a creative sense and actually do some of what we would recognize as the creative thinking, as the creative decision making, as the designing? Or is its role merely to inspire something in a human? So let's tackle for a minute what it would actually look like for an AI to take on some of that creative decision making, some of that autonomy. And the best example I think we have of what that would look like is to look at how human creative people, how human designers make decisions, for which we have the field of design cognition or the cognitive science of design, which is all about how designers reason when they are engaged in the design process. Not about the methods that they use, that's what they are trying to do, but the kind of reasoning that takes place when they follow them. So here's an example from a famous paper from the 1990s that shows how an architect, in this case a student architect, like a final year student, makes the decision about how to put together the buildings for a public school design that they were, they were putting together. They first started looking at the site and they saw that the shape of the like overall contours of the site suggested that maybe a diagonal row of classrooms as depicted here might be a useful thought. Then they looked at that and thought, ah, you know what? Let's really lean into that idea of stairs. This looks a little bit like a row of stairs. What would that look like? And they produced another version of the design, this time with three pairs of classrooms. So we've got six classrooms here, right? So they're looking at three pairs of classrooms arranged in these three L shapes. Note that at this point in the reasoning, no attention is being given to what it would actually look like from the ground, this is all the reasoning has been done from the plan level because why need a human follow a rational perspective? Sometimes we just do silly stuff. Sometimes we just think about things differently and try things out. And sometimes it works amazingly. Because this student then went to look at this and thought actually this design, the between the rises of the stairs, actually creates this nice kind of trio of indoor, outdoor, partially sheltered spaces that could be used to keep the children of different age groups, like you know, year one and two, year three and four, year five and six, partially separate, and give them this semi-enclosed sort of sheltered space in which they'd be mostly able to play with peers of roughly the same age. So this now is an interesting design perspective. Not one playground, but three semi-detached playgrounds. And not one line of buildings, but a set of three L-shapes. The final design does not in any way resemble the thought process that the designer used to get there. And this, if you think even for a minute about your own design process, is entirely normal. We are crazy enough to think like this all the time. We don't tend to follow the A to B to C path. We do weird stuff, get inspired, try things, forget things, see things that we didn't put there, and yet it somehow ends up working. How can a machine do part of that? There's actually a model of this kind of idea. It's called reflection in action. It comes from this design theorist uh, and education theorist, actually, Donald Schoen. You start with what Schoen calls an internal design representation. 
which is just a fancy way of saying you have an idea in your mind, right? You've got some thought. So as a designer, the first thing you do is externalize that, draw it, you make a sketch, you take some action and produce a representation of your design. Or if you've already started, change the representation of your evolving design. You make a new sketch, it's different from your last one. And that produces what Schoen calls an external design representation, a drawing, some thing that captures how you're currently thinking about your solution. It might be a, a mock-up or a wireframe or a plan or a section or a facade or just a doodle, some capturing of where your thought processes are now. And then this is the bit that really captures the reflectivity, that conversational element of design. You reflect on what you've done. You see the design that you have put on paper. Now not the design in your head, but the design that has been realized. You see in it something that you didn't put there. You go, oh, that's interesting. I see a way those classrooms could create indoor outdoor spaces. I see in my sketch something that I didn't intend. And in doing so, I reframe the problem. I come up with a new way of approaching it and I update my internal design representation, which is a fancy cognitive scientist way of saying I have a new idea. And are you hair off in that direction and you explore it and maybe it's rubbish, but it's something new. If this is what design looks like, if this is what creative cognition looks like, then how can AI help there? It's not so much going to be the iRobot dream of a machine that produces drawings. It's going to be something a little more subtle, something that tries to inspire us, but does so by just edging towards interesting ideas. Sounds very abstract. So let me share some examples from my own work of how I've tried to approach, approach this problem as a researcher. This is a system that we call the Creative Sketching Apprentice. The Creative Sketching Apprentice could take one sketch, labeled sketch that you, you'd drawn, and then generate another sketch that was similar, but of a completely different thing. It's kind of like playing a free association game, but with sketches. So if you drew this ax at the top here, it would draw this dolphin. And it would say, oh yeah, that ax looks like a dolphin. If you drew this toothbrush, it would say, oh yeah, that looks like an aircraft carrier. Here, look, like this one. If you drew a dumbbell, it would say, that's a baseball. If you drew that bridge, it would say, that's a rainbow. Ceiling fan, flower, bathtub, yet another aircraft carrier. There were a lot of aircraft carriers in our data set. They're, actually, they were the same amount as they were of anything else, but they were so radically different that they kept getting matched stylistically to things. This works by having two separate definitions for similarity. It has one based on the meaning of the word, like how similar is the idea of axe to the idea of dolphin? Pretty different, right? But how uh, similar is this image? Very. So it looks for things with a high structural or visual similarity, but a low conceptual or verbal similarity. So that then can be used to produce these weird stimuli. Now this was just a, a proof of concept, but the idea here is that you can be working on a creative task and a computer, I mean, is not gonna bombard you with these things, but at some point an AI can provide inspiration, can provide the opportunity for metaphor or for reframing or for thinking about your design in different ways. The goal of this machine is to maybe help you see new kinds of things, to send you off down those rabbit holes, to send you off in those random, interesting, potentially fruitful directions, to conspire towards serendipity. Uh, I did this work for the record uh, with a PhD student by the name of Pega Karimi, as well as her other supervisors, Nick Davis and my own mentor, Mary Lou Meyer. Of course, none of these pieces of work are ever done uh, alone. Another example of how I've looked for ways that AI can be involved in creative decision-making is in food. Uh, in this project, we're exploring surprising food combinations and how to push people towards making unusual decisions. Making unusual food decisions, I mean. We'll actually be doing some more experiments in this area. If you look in the next couple of weeks for uh, studies involving this app Q Chef, 
uh, we'll be looking for people who are willing to use this app and take it home and cook some of its unusual suggestions and interested in the way that it might affect your food decision making. Because this is part of that creative decision making just in a uh, an application that is a bit more the day to day, right? Let's take an unusual food combination that the system has identified as something that you could be persuaded to try. It's a little too weird for you though. It's a little outside of your comfort zone. And the system wants you to try new things because there's evidence that diverse diets tend to be more healthy, assuming you don't count all of the different kinds of chocolate bars separately. But diverse in terms of actual real whole foods tends to produce better health outcomes and certainly produce more confident, capable uh, cooks. So let's say our system identified some truly weird combination like Parmesan cheese and vanilla. That's a bit too much. You're probably not gonna wanna try that straight up. So it starts you out with a conceptually related unusual pairing that is a little bit more palatable, like mozzarella and fig. Still a combination of a sweet thing and a cheese, but just like while mozzarella is similar to, cheese, uh, to parmesan cheese and fig is like, okay, in the same group of flavors as vanilla, neither of them is like overwhelmingly weird when combined. All right, so you try mozzarella and fig and you agree as I do that it's an amazing combination. You should totally check it out. And then you're ready for something a little bit more weird. You're now starting to get a little bit of uh, your legs underneath you in this space of cheeses and weird sweet things. So the next thing we try you out on is vintage cheddar and chocolate. Again, sort of conceptually related to vanilla. Chocolate has often contains vanilla uh, as a flavor additive. And vintage cheddar is a firm cheese in the same sense that Parmigiano is. But this is not as weird a combination, and our machine knows this, as Parmesan and vanilla, which are very, very polarizing flavors. Chocolate and cheese do sometimes go together. So maybe the system encourages you to try this next time. Give it a shot, by the way, if you're a bit more adventurous than the fig and mozz people. Maybe a grilled cheese sandwich with a vintage cheddar and just some dark chocolate thrown in there. Uh, and then if you like that, if you come back and saying, okay, you've taken me on a journey, I can now accept slightly more weird things or substantially more weird things, maybe then you would be willing to try the third one, vanilla and parmesan. Now, how is this relevant to creative AI? If you accept that one day, machines will know more than us. In fact, they already do when it comes to being able to access and recall large databases of information. Then the maybe, the machine will be aware of something that is a good design decision, but also be aware that it's too weird for you to accept. How could a machine push you towards accepting the divergent? How could a machine push to you towards the unusual, the original, the surprising? Maybe it could take you on one of these kind of surprise walks, as we call it, and send you off towards a set of experiences that will scaffold or prepare you for the really weird thing that it wants you to do. Maybe it could send you through a couple of iterations of Schoen's cycle of reflection and action, each time encouraging you to experience something a little bit more unusual until that third one, the really off the wall concept, is palatable to your design sensibilities. Very speculative, of course, but a lot of my research takes place in that weird AI stuff, speculative space. What do we know from doing this kind of work? What do we know about creative autonomy, about the capacity for a machine to take on some of the responsibility that goes into producing a creative output? Well, the way I think about it is that autonomy requires figuring out what is an appropriate aesthetic from experience. So you need to interpret, as in you can't just have the answer, the system must have the capacity to generate a situationally appropriate framing of a problem, which is something that is possible but difficult in a machine learning context. It must be an appropriate aesthetic. By aesthetic, I mean a decision about what to value in the current creative problem, what to want in what you are working on currently.
I don't mean aesthetic as you might see it on a Vaporwave video. How do you choose an aesthetic? How do you as a creator decide what kind of look, feel, vibe approach is going to work for the project that you're looking at? Well, how does a machine start to do that as well? Not just once a human gives it the right approach, how can it optimize for that? Because that's easy. We use AI in that way all the time. Here is exactly what we want in this race car. Go away and evolve, learn, etc. The optimal race car that is the lightest, the most powerful, the cheapest, etc. There's a lot of good AI work in that space. That's most computational design. I'm interested in the computational conceptual design. What happens before you get to the details, before you have an exact, exact idea about what you're trying to do? How do you form an appropriate aesthetic? How do you interpret a problem to decide what to pursue? And how do you do that from experience rather than from explicit instructions? We're mostly looking for interesting tricks and twists and ways to make tools that help human creators do interesting things. Because until then, there are plenty of ways. Until we have the capacity for a machine to produce its own interpretations from experience that allow it to decide on an appropriate aesthetic for a design problem, I don't think we're going to have generally creative designing machines. But there's a great deal of space to make these kinds of interesting twists on the machine learning formula that I've been talking about. A great deal of ways to inspire creativity in humans through interesting and novel applications of interesting and novel technologies. And I wanted to end this lecture here by way of saying, if you're interested in these sorts of ideas, look me up. Look me up now or towards the end of your degree. And uh, Liam as well, we both work in this space because there may be research opportunities to go down one of these particular rabbit holes and make something weird and new and useful. Well, mostly weird and new. I'll see you in class.